welcome to our first um, podcast series on Talking Presidency. My name is Dennis Schrei. I'm the Program Manager of the Multinational Development Policy Dialogue of Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Brussels. I'm very happy to welcome our first guest today, which is um, Mrs. Hildegard Bentele. Mrs. Bentele, she is a member of the European Parliament from the European People's Party in Germany. And uh, currently she also is a member of the Committee uh, on Development. And in this function today, I'm very glad that we can have an open discussion. So welcome, Mrs. Bentele, and very happy to have you with us today. Yeah, thank uh, you very much, Mr. Schreier. I'm you're welcome. glad to you. Tomorrow the German presidency officially starts. Germany will take over the political lead of the European Union from Croatia. The presidency will drive forward the council's work on EU legislation, ensuring the continuity of the EU agenda and cooperation among member states. This is also a new start um, uh, for um, a trialogue between three presidencies, Croatia, um, and also um, Portugal and Slovenia. So the three countries will work together closely to ensure the continuity and effectiveness of the Council's work. As you are a member of the European Parliament and a member of the Development uh, Committee, your work focuses on the external dimension on policies uh, of the European Union. And I think the European global commitment to peace, stability, good governance, democracy and sustainable development. If we look in today's international disorder, we can see a more and more assertive China, a more and more self-isolating US. What influence the European Union can have to be heard and respected as a reliable global partner in multilateral fora? Yeah, I think uh, I think the EU has a crucial role to play since the EU is very um, reliable and very um, credible in terms of multilateralism. I think the the, the, the the key characteristic of the EU is to strengthen multilateralism. And we could see this very clearly also in the um, COVID-19 pandemic, since we acted uh, in strengthening the WHO very strongly, and uh, we gathered money in, in donors, um, donors' conferences to not only look only inside into the European Union, but also to think about the global effects of the pandemic, since we know even if you, if you get the EU uh, back on track uh, of the economic development, uh, we are in very close contact with the world. And if we import again COVID-19 to us, we have a huge problem. In addition, if you look to Africa, we know that COVID-19 there um, leads to to um, to hunger needs to a food crisis and this means that people will um will will flee and will seek a better future other <laughs> in in other parts of the world mainly in the eu so we have to act uh, also outside of the eu and i think the eu has sent very good signals uh, that the pandemic is a global a global issue and we have to deal with it in uh, by a global response yeah, thank you. And um, as I understood, the EU has recently announced to redirect almost 36 billion euro through the Team Euro packages to address these shattering effects of the COVID-19 crisis in partner countries and region. So how does the EU ensure that the money is allocated to countries most in need? Uh, yeah, um, uh, we have already established corporations uh, in the field of health and also sanitation. So that means in the first step, we just increased the existing corporations, for example, Nigeria, for example, Ethiopia. We channel the money through existing programs. And then we have additional programs like the Airbridge, which brings uh, brings uh, equipment and, and uh, test kits uh, to areas where the supply chains have uh, do not exist anymore. So we have uh, we channel very fast money through existing programs. We re enforce them, we strengthen them by additional money, and then we establish a new cooperation, uh, for example, via the Airbridge. Thank you very much. Um, if we take into account the amount of uh, 130 billion euro, which Germany has recently launched to recover its economy, focused exclusively on Germany. And now 
we compare this amount to 36 billion euro, um, is this amount really enough to support um, the entire global south in these difficult times? It's definitely not enough. Uh, but I think uh, we um, and we cannot solve the problem with uh, with uh, with uh, development money. I think uh, to um, uh, of course we have an emergency re emergency response and this is covered by the thirty six uh, uh, million euros. Uh, but we will have to focus even more on strengthening economic cooperation uh, with uh, with Africa, for example. We have to have a better climate for investments. We have to increase the econo economic cooperation since um, only this will lead to a sustainable uh, economic recovery and also to jobs since we know that the population is very young in, in Africa and uh, now it's increased by the, by, by the food scarcity. Uh, we have to, in general, uh, engage the European economy much stronger on the African continent. And I can see also in the framework of the Green Deal, since we talk about energy partnerships, so we talk about new opportunities for countries, for example, in North Africa, where tourism has collapsed, where uh, oil income has collapsed. So we have to search for new sectors where the EU and Africa can um, meet on an equal footing also. So for example, the energy partnership is of strategic uh, importance for the EU, but uh, 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 North of Africa can deliver also, um, uh, uh, can deliver energy. So, and this is an industrial partnership uh, since we need, uh, since we need uh, the facilities, the energy facilities, uh, since we need high tech also to implement these pipelines whatsoever. So we, um, we have the chance for new economic partnerships with, with Africa to uh, prevent uh, uh, economic downfall and also to uh, uh, shape the Green Deal uh, in the European Union. Thank you very much. So I would fully agree. So it's a mixture of measures um, to basically um, yeah, support uh, the African continent, but we are talking a lot in these days on real partnership. And the European Union is currently um, preparing for a new EU Africa strategy. Um, the next summit will be held in October. Um, and we are, of course, all uh, wondering what is new about the strategy uh, compared to former strategies. What is a new EU uh, African approach for joint partnership for joint cooperation? Well, I perceive it a much broader approach than in the past because it encompasses also innovation, digitalization, climate cooperation, peace and security migration. I think these issues haven't been so much on the agenda before. Um, and I think uh, also the, the visit of the whole commission uh, in February in, in Africa shows that Africa is a horizontal issue uh, for the Commission. I think this is a very good approach. And with this comes the idea to strengthen also the regional um, integration in, in Africa. So the EU supports with much more money than in the past, uh, the efforts to, to integrate on the regional level to, to really also form some kind of yeah union. It cannot be compared to the European Union, but um, uh, also by establishing the African continental free trade area uh, uh, that uh, um, to, to uh, establish um, internal market in the in the in in, in Africa uh, which could lead to much more wealth than in the past and less dependency uh, on uh, imports so I think this kind of uh, development is, 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 is a very good one and it's a new one. Uh, and I think we should follow up on this path because this would mean that Africa can be more assertive also on the global stage. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense. If we, if we look at, um, there has, have been a lot of meta strategies around in, in the past. So there have been a lot of EU Africa strategies. And um, if, if we look at the reality on the ground, we see um, that Africa is really suffering uh, on different angles or from different sides. We have um, migration crisis, we have the impact of um, strong uh, bad weather events, we have climate change, we, we also see a lot of unemployment for, for the younger generation, lost opportunities in the past. 
Um, so there are a lot of challenges, but as you said, there are also um, opportunities for um, working together with, with this young generation and giving them a chance where they live, giving them a, a chance for, for economic and political participation. So um, what kind of strategy does the EU have to engage with African countries uh, on, uh, on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned uh, that, uh, well, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical if we only target a national level, since we have seen that um, also if we only use or we mainly use budget support to um, uh, to support the countries. And uh, I'm a new member and I don't know yet anything, but I'm a bit more skeptical or critical about this general support. Um, I can also coming <laughs> from a German system, which is very decentralized. Um, uh, and give, given the size of many African countries, given the fact that uh, borders have been drawn, not on a natural basis, that I think we should look much more on the region, uh, on, on the subnational levels, on the local levels, since their uh, developments can be uh, initiated much faster. So I would... Um, I would suggest or I would I would wish and suggest that we look more on on this on the subnational levels and also on more on civil society um also uh, since you are interviewing me from a Konrad Adenauer Foundation I think we also need to strengthen the decentralization and and the level where political decisions take place that they have direct influence on people and this is not always the national level there's a lot of corruption we have the biggest problem I think the um European business has is with corruption and uh, this is um, very much on the national level and uh, where nobody knows where the money goes if we, if we, if we, if you pour it lower uh, then uh, people would have more insights uh, what, 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 what happens with the money so I would um, if I can have a wish for the next four years I would more target subnational or local levels uh, with, with European money. And also, this is very often the place where, um, where economic actors start business. They have local partners and they cooperate and, and they're a, a project or a, a company starts. Yeah, this fully uh, coincides with our experiences that at the local level, uh, you find really committed uh, people. Sometimes you can... Uh, built upon um, economic opportunities. Uh, and um, so I, from my observation uh, on, on the EU development policy, it's still targeting the central governments uh, very much and cooperation with central governments. And I can only encourage you as a member of the European Parliament to um, try to uh, support and try to identify programs uh, for supporting city to city cooperations, local government to local government, peer to peer um, mm. experience exchange, where real partnerships and long term partnerships can, can be set up. And I think there are already good examples like the convenient of mayors and uh, other examples which, which are going in this sense. So I, I fully agree. And also, um, if, if I could express uh, a wish, is it, it would be really important to, to strengthen um, political parties at all levels and not only at the national level, but also to strengthen um, their, the way they operate, the way they uh, work. Um, and um, this is very often, unfortunately, an actor which is somehow forgotten or left behind. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the, um, another topic, which is uh, quite high on the agenda of the German presidency, it's um, the issue of fair supply chains. Um, I think that Germany is strongly advocating at the moment for um, fair supply chains in the textile sector. The Minister um, for Economic Cooperation and Development, Mr. Gerd Müller, he um, created the Green Button Initiative where textile products, I think, have to meet around 26 um, ecological and uh, uh, social standards. And um, what is um, your take on, on the initiative and also how such initiatives can be Europeanized or even globalized because uh, of course it's important that a country uh, steps forward and creates such initiatives but we have global supply chains we have many countries which uh, do not have similar initiatives so how can we create alliances here for for more regional or global 
um, chains. Yeah, I think this is a very um, current issue. And I just talked today with my colleagues in, in Bundestag about it, since we talk about a German supply chain law. So which comes at the same moment as the Commissioner for Justice has uh, presented a study also uh, looking into supply chains and um, also uh, uh, taking stock of the progress in the last years. And it's very clear that voluntary uh, uh, commitments uh, do not work anymore. Um, I'm also personally involved in the issue of deforestation. So we talk about commodities which cause deforestation abroad. And uh, there is an ongoing uh, report um, how we can regulate um, this kind of imports uh, and, and supply chains. And there will be more obligations in the future for companies. We have, of course, uh, strike a balance uh, uh, because we don't want to run the risk that European companies disengage from Africa because of uh, two, uh, two uh, unfulfillable uh, requirements. Um, so we have to strike a balance uh, what kind of uh, companies you want to target. We have to look at SMEs. We have to look how close they are um, how far this chain is going and how much they can be made real, uh, uh, responsible for what is going on underground. For example, in terms of uh, sustainable land use or land conversion, um, there are no registers. They are, um, uh, it's, it's hard to see uh, also what is a forest. I mean, we need to have a, de a definition also what is deforestation. So uh, we are currently, uh, there's an ongoing process uh, and the EU will be certainly active in this regard. And we also, Germany, we have an ongoing, um, mm, there is an open, um, how do we say, an inquiry with, with uh, German business, how much they already uh, report about due diligence. Uh, and this is the second wave. And we have even in the coalition treaty a uh, uh, paragraph saying if only 50, less than 50% comply with due diligence, there will be a, a law about it. So we, this is a very timely, timely uh, discussion. And we also talk about trade. We talk about trade chapters where we can increase uh, the criteria for economic, uh, 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 ecological uh, um, assessments and human rights. So just a very timely uh, uh, discussion, which will be certainly brought also uh, put brought forward by the um, German presidency and will might maybe also in only a one year time lead to a real uh, result. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bentele for um, really this uh, enlightening interview and for giving us a short insight in your work uh, in the current projects. Um, also, what we can expect from, from Germany in this um, upcoming presidency. We will closely follow um, the discussions in the European Parliament uh, in the topics mentioned. And we uh, would very much look forward to keep in touch, uh, to uh, get your insights uh, on um, results and uh, on um, achievements. And um, if you have any um, f last word, I would like to, to give you the floor one more time. Um, if you could express really one core expectations to the German presidency, uh, which would this be? Well, the biggest wish I think of every MP currently is that we have a budget. We need a budget. <laughs> So I very much hope that uh, Germany will uh, finish the task which was given from the Finnish to the Croatian and now to the German residents. We, ne we need a budget because we cannot do programming in development cooperation if we don't have a budget. And uh, very important also uh, in, in the devel development cooperation is that we get new financial instrument, the NDK, <laughs> uh, which will make our cooperation much easier and which also lead, will lead to more um, participation and more insights of the European Parliament in development cooperation. So I cross fingers that um, it will be possible to agree on, on the budget, which is, of course, always a very tricky issue because expectations from different member states are quite different on where to set priorities. So I, I, I can foresee very difficult negotiations, especially in the final run up of the negotiations. So I really wish uh, the other German president, presidency good luck. What is your specific role in this uh, in, in the um, 
not just in the signing of the budget, but what is the specific role of the European Parliament from now until the end of the year? Uh, you mean in the in the German in, in the budget in the budget negotiations? In the budget. Well, in the budget, of course. I mean, uh, our, well, our main interest is, of course, that uh, we come back uh, to the old prop uh, old proposal that we have uh, more than one percent uh, of the budget, since we have much more uh, tasks than in the past. And what is very important for us that we have a say in the recovery plan. And it's also very important that we start, that we give a signal that we want to pay back the debts, which we are taking up for the first time. Uh, we want to start to pay them back in this, in this mandate and not to push uh, a debts to future budgets and to future generations. These are the three main issues. We want to have a say in the recovery plan. We want to pay back the debts uh, and we need a, a, an increased budget for the new tasks which are ahead of us. Okay, thank you very much, Mrs. Bentler, and um, I wish you again good luck for the next months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and SoundCloud. Please find the links in the description. Thank you.